prior to Grenfell, the FBA was um, uh, fully supportive of non-combustible materials on high-rise buildings and, and high-risk buildings. And, uh, and we still are, that's still the case, still, still fully supportive of non-combustible um, construction methods. Um, but this was developed because you know, people are using combustible, um, uh, combustible materials and, and there's been a bit of a change of uh, tone from the FPA in several sectors, um, which is you know, instead of um, just saying, you know, we, we don't support that, don't do that, we've tried to develop methods so that if people are doing things like building with combustible cladding, that we've got a way of, of uh, helping them make it safer which what this test standard would, would do. And, and it, uh, similar with uh, sort of mass timber construction as well, you know, we've instead of just saying, you know, we don't support it, we don't, don't think it's safe, we've instead started doing research to, to try and find ways and encourage people to, if they are going to do it, to, to do it in a safer manner than, than they were doing previously. It's interesting the the, um the auditing side of things, the verification side of things, because I spent most of my career with a, with certification bodies and um, I, I see what advantages they bring. And actually for cladding systems, I don't know that they exist really, the, the schemes to support them as the insurers might want them or as the regulators might want them. And that's something I, I personally be keen, and I'm sure the FBA would be keen to, to advocate. Um, and I'd be interested at some point, George, if you could kind of help us understand how Risk 501 would support product or system certification such that insurers and regulators can can start specifying that. Um, yeah, that, do you want to touch on that? Uh, yeah, sure, can, sure, yeah. We, we've made some change to Risk 501 to, to make it easier as well. Um, so there's uh, there's this focus on design principles in there. So, so uh, the, uh, um, the the client would have to specify you know the design principles which would normally be done through for a design guide and that has to be available for the test house. So at the moment, you know, they send in drawings for for exactly what they've done for the test rig, but it doesn't really explain how they would then install that system on a building because um, you know you're not testing a specific building, you're testing a cladding system that's suitable yeah. for multiple buildings. So we've done that. Um, one of the ways we've done that is by creating a virtual building which specifies where the floor heights are, puts them at realistic separation distances, um, and that means that, um, that the designer has to, has to be consistent on every test because they've got to consider the same, uh, the same building, so they've got to consider the same features every time. Similar for the, for the window opening, um, or oh, sorry, the, uh, the burn chamber opening at the moment, where that is, that gets treated very differently. Even in the government tests, they, um, uh, which was MHCLG at the time, you know, they surround it with this thick aluminium pod, which we would never see in the real world. Um, and so we've put clauses in to prevent that. Uh, we've also developed a, uh, a method for material characterization. Now this was to address um, uh, a few specific problems, but um, basically what the service does is that uh, any, any uh, significant materials that are sent for testing, we would also send off for, for small scale um, chemical analysis. And then when, uh, when these products are approved and then put in a building later on, we're able to at any time in that building's life sample those materials in our test lab and, and confirm that um, the materials installed in a building were, were not significantly different than the materials that, that we fire tested. I, I, I keep asking myself, with all of these changes, inclu including the regulatory system, but not just, and, and this is, this is a, a, a prime example of that, we're proposing to change a test method, and I keep asking myself, would, if this change had have happened before Grenfell, would that have stopped? Grenfell happening, and I have to say, most of what most of the changes I've seen so far mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have, because people wanted to game the system or you know play around with the system. I don't, I don't think that's um, up for discussion. Um, but the material analysis that you just talked about that seems to me to be a small aspect which really could have played a part if somebody had have checked by cutting off a small sample of what was delivered to site when it was being upgraded and done a check to say, is this still what was tested in the, in the initial type tests? That perhaps at least has the possibility of being found out rather than somebody claiming this is um, of, of this performance, this classification. Um, it seems to me like a very easy change which could come out of risk 501 and 
then any specifications after it uh, and any insurance requirements, any regulatory requirements, it seems to me like a, 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 a good step forward. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's not always um, malicious intent that, that materials change. Obviously, sure. you, do, you do get sure. test specials, you get people sending off special special materials for testing that, that, that they'd never use in the real world because they're too expensive. Uh, but, you know, there's also continuous improvement that happens and uh, small changes that people make to the product that they'll make every year doesn't, necessi doesn't necessitate, ne necessitate retesting the product. Um, but um, over time, these build up, and at some point, they should get it retested, but they don't quite realise when. And suddenly, the product's staying on the market, and, it, and it's significantly different to the um, product that was originally tested. And there's also um, a sort of poor specification as well of products, which is something we've tried to tighten up, is, is the actual specification that goes in, because, like I say, there is variability in products in terms of thickness and also the chemistry that goes on. Um, and... and and you know, that's something that also needs to be tighter to prevent the materials on buildings performing completely differently to, to the ones in a test. So, so a question to, to either of you, and um, I, I don't know who, who's best to answer, answer this, but it almost sounds like utopia, this test method then, George. It's significant improvements on, on what we've got right now. What, once it's published, what's stopping us? What, what challenges, what obstacles? Uh, uh, is the construction industry going to face when when adopting this, and how can we how can we move cladding testing and certification forward easily from both yeah. perspectives, from yours, George, and perhaps from Andy's as well. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was utopia. I mean, uh, prior to Grenfell, the FBA was. Um, uh, fully supportive of non-combustible materials on high-rise buildings and, and high-risk buildings, and uh, and we still are. That's still the case. Still, still fully supportive of non-combustible um, construction methods. Um, but this was developed because you know people are using combustible um, uh, combustible materials, and and there's been a bit of a change of uh, tone from the FPA in several sectors, um, which is you know instead of um, just saying you know we don't support that, don't do that, we've tried to develop methods so that if people are doing things like building with combustible cladding, that we've got a way of, of uh, helping them make it safer, which is what this test standard would, would do. And, and it, uh, similar with uh, sort of mass timber construction as well, you know, we've instead of just saying, you know, we don't support it, we don't, don't think it's safe, we've instead started doing research to, to try and find ways and encourage people to, if they are going to do it, to, to do it in a safer manner than, than they were doing previously. In terms of the issues that people face, you know, there is... There is, there's much more constraints here on uh, on, on the design and, and the construction of it, uh, which is going to be difficult for, for, for clients who uh, they want to achieve that to meet. Um, that will go forward to uh, to installers for the building, approvers, risk assessors. You know, they, they, they do need to understand all of the constraints that have been put on, so that when it's on a building, they, they understand that it's, it's um, still the, the, the same as what was tested. Um, but we have tried to make that much easier uh, through the way the standard specified to make it much easier for people to understand exactly what was tested and what needs to be replicated on a building, you know, which features actually, um, how, how do the design principles get interpreted, I suppose. Um, okay. yeah. Thanks, George. Mm -hmm. Andy, um, do you see any benefits from an insurance perspective of going down this, this modified route and Perhaps also the previous question: What what yeah. challenges yeah. would it would it I, bring? I think um, just picking up on the challenges point first. I, I think the key thing for me is that from sort of building industry perspective, they might see it as a, a yet another test methodology standard, whatever you want to call it, where um, it's going to cost us money to put it through that testing regime. Um, so it's about the promotion of it. It's selling the benefits, isn't it, that, uh, of this particular methodology um, and encouraging use of it. Now, I think that falls to all stakeholders. You know, if you feel there is real benefit in this uh, methodology, then uh, absolutely we, we should be pushing it, shouldn't we? You know, everybody involved should be uh, should be promoting this. Um, but that's my experience. Whenever um, a new test standard, a test methodology comes out, it can take time to gain momentum. And I think that's all about the promotion. Um, 
it, it comes down to sort of regulation as well, doesn't it? You know, ref referencing in regulation as a test methodology that can be used um, is always helpful because that puts it very much on the radar of the building industry. So that that's how I'd sum up my sort of experience um, in the past um, with some of the challenges around um, anything new, if you like, in this world. Um, coming on to uh, your other question was, um, I think, benefits, wasn't it, to um, general property protection perspective? Well, I, I think ultimately, um, it's, it, it, it must and it should, and I believe it will, you know, we can end up with more robust um, far as resilient buildings because we are looking at real world. So we are testing in the real world um, and, and, you know, seeing what those results are. And because if we're going, if we, we're getting, we're getting there in that respect, then, you know, that does contribute to the overall resilience of a business. Um, so it might prevent what, what might have been a very serious fire, um, you know, significantly disrupting those operations um, of that business, you know, as we know, um, you know, a significant fire can actually end a business. And, and I think we know, I, I can't remember what the latest stats are, but there is a figure, isn't there, that if you suffer a significant fire as a business, there's a very high percentage chance that um, you won't be able to recover from that. Um, so, you know, providing more resilient, uh, greater resilience in, build, in the building stock has got to be a good thing um, for business for insurers, for all interested stakeholders. Um, and also, you know, if you imagine um, a block of flats with, uh, you know, cladding uh, all up the outside of it, and uh, actually that building is much more resilient than it might otherwise have been designed to, then it does allow that sort of reoccupation of that building um, much quicker. So again, we get more resilience in the building. And of course, that does reduce the cost of any temporary upheaval, um, both in sort of human terms and also in financial terms. So I, I think just, Summing up what I've said there is that, you know, that this, this may naturally help drive up property resilience standards across the building industry.